Uh, everybody, uh, please welcome Andrew Polster from Blockstream for MoneroCon Madness Schnorr Schnadness. So this, this was actually a placeholder title because I was writing slides on the plane and I, I forgot what I'd submitted, but I, uh, I forgot to change it, so here we go. Um, cool. So um, as Brandon mentioned, I'm here to talk about the challenges of implementing threshold signatures, the challenges of implementing Schnorr signatures. Um, so I'll give a bit of background about what that means and then just sort of list, like kind of go through a series of problems that I encounter have encountered over the last couple of years. Um, not all at once, it's terrible. It's like every couple of months there's like some new weird surprising thing here. Um, so to start, let me explain. Where am I pointing? There we go. Let me explain what a Schnorr signature is. Um, so a Schnorr signature is a digital signature algorithm. Um, digital signature algorithms are like kind of at the heart of cryptocurrencies of all shapes and sizes. Um, Bitcoin uses something called ECDSA. Um, there's a proposal for Bitcoin to change ECDSA or to, to add Schnorr signatures um, to Bitcoin as part of a proposal called Taproot. Um, but lots of other currencies such as Monero have had Schnorr signatures pretty much forever. Um, like Monero has had, uh, by virtue of using the ED25519 library and curve has been using Schnorr signatures since back when it was Bitcoin. Um, although I should maybe, maybe give a caveat that the Monero style signatures are actually part of a much larger scheme, uh, Ring CT, uh, which Aravind talked about in a fair bit more detail. So my next slide here talks about how simple Schnorr signatures are. And I need to qualify that with, well, this is simple if you look at how Ring CT is implemented. You can find some equations where if you delete a whole bunch of terms, you will be left with this little thing basically. Um, so in practice, sometimes this is more complicated because it's embedded in larger context. But at the heart of it, a Schnorr signature is just these three, these three formulas here. Or this is actually the instructions for signing, for producing a signature. Um, you choose this thing called a nonce, a uniformly random thing. We, I'm going to call this K. You compute this hash E. This hash is a hash of your transaction. It's a hash of your public key. The hash of what's called your public nonce, which is derived from K. It's just everything that you know at the time of signing, you throw into this hash E. And then you do this very simple equation. Um, you take your, your secret nonce, you take your secret key, X, multiplied by this hash thing, and you add them together, or subtract them, or whatever you want to do. Um, you get, uh, and what you're left with is this little linear equation, OK? Um, so this is pretty simple by itself. What's cool is because it's a linear equation, and this is why I'm being sloppy about pluses or minuses, um, is that if you have multiple signers all trying to jointly produce a signature or jointly produce a, say, a ring CT proof, this is very easy. Here's a transition from multiple signers, from single signers to multiple signers. Okay? All I've done is add some indices. In the multi-signer case, everybody independently chooses their nonce, ki. They, uh, they combine their stuff. They compute this hash of whatever everybody knows together. Then they each independently produce a signature here at the bottom, and then they combine those signatures. So you're basically like, adding a combined step. Producing short signatures is a two-step process. After each one of them, you add a combined step, and there's your transition from single signatures to multi-signatures. So that's great. And that extends to other more complicated things, such as bulletproofs, and therefore uh, bulletproofs or ring CT or omni ring or, or whatever you want to, whatever uh, way you might want to produce proofs in Monero this kind of simplicity carries over. And this is very tempting as a protocol designer. Um, and then also, if you care about provable security, which you probably should, uh, the provable security story for Schnorr is quite a bit better for uh, them for ECDSA. And I'm not going to go too much into that. So let me start by talking about a couple of issues just with single Schnorr signatures. And then I'm going to talk about multi-signatures. And then if I have time, I'm going to talk about threshold signatures. And we'll see like the problems keep layering up in practice. Um, and the first problem we have comes from this first line here. Um, I'll use a pointer. Or maybe I won't, because I think the live streamers don't see the pointer. I'm unsure about that. Um, this dollar sign here, this is cute. This is, this is a pun that's used in academic cryptography. The idea is you're flipping a coin to generate a random bit, zero or one. A dollar sign is 100 coins, you need 100 bits, so 100 and 256 bits, whatever. Hundreds of bits are dollars, so you're flipping dollars worth of pennies. 
Um, so you're generating a uniformly random thing here. Um, in practice, it's difficult to generate uniform randomness, especially if you've got something like a hardware token or something which um, is um, like maybe has limited access to entropy, maybe it doesn't have any storage, maybe it's uh, maybe it has uh, speed limitations or CPU speed limitations, whatever. Um, and the issue here is that the randomness that you need really does need to be uniformly random. If you're off, if you're biased by even like a single bit, or even in principle less than a bit, like maybe every quarter, um, like your signatures have like the top bit is zero a bit more often than it should be. In principle, and actually in practice, that is enough for people to extract your secret keys given enough signatures. And there was a paper in the Bitcoin case, uh, Bitcoin space, by uh, Nadia Henninger and Joachim Breitner uh, recently, a couple months ago, that actually used such a uh, um, uh, heretofore theoretical attack to extract a bunch of secret keys from old Bitcoin transactions that had somehow produced bias nonces. Um, and there's all sorts of interesting, I encourage you guys to look up this paper, there's all sorts of interesting forensics about how this happened or whatever. But basically there were a few old signing devices or, or code bases or something that were biasing their nonces by a few bits or maybe a lot of bits, they weren't actually reusing nonces or doing anything like completely horrible beyond the pale. They just had biased, nonce, biased nonces and given enough signatures. This was enough to, uh, to leak keys. Um, and then even if you could somehow solve this problem of getting unbiased randomness, if you're getting this from a hardware token or something, ideally you'd want to verify that the hardware token is somehow producing unbiased uh, randomness. And so let me elaborate on that a little bit. Um, so there's a scheme called RFC 6979, which is very simple. Um, well, in principle, it's simple. It's simple. In practice, it involves like, way too much hashing and extra CPU time. Um, what you do is you take your secret key, you take your message, you throw those into a pseudo-random function, and you take the output of that. It's a pseudo-random function. You can assume that the output is uniformly random. That's a cryptographic assumption. Um, but it's a better assumption than like, assuming that reading bits off of a, an un unconnected diode or something is unbiased. And importantly, this is in principle verifiable. You're sort of going through a deterministic algorithm starting from some secrets and some message and stuff. Um, but in practice, it's next to impossible to verify. So you need, if you had a hardware wallet producing randomness this way and you wanted as a user to guarantee that the hardware wallet was always doing this, and not like accidentally biasing something or deliberately biasing something, which it could do in, in undetectable ways, you would need your hardware wallet to like somehow produce a zero knowledge proof or something that it went through this algorithm. Um, so that kind of sucks. It's very heavy. There's no code for this. It's unclear whether existing hardware tokens today are powerful enough to do this. So, uh, so okay, RFC 6979, that's great. It's a total solution, but it's unverifiable. So here's a way to get verifiability. Um, using this technique called sign to contract. And what sign to contract does is it takes this equation, um, and this will be the last equation, sort of. I'm going to repeat some earlier equations, but I'm, I'm trying, going to try to make this accessible. Basically, you, the host, the user of your hardware wallet, provides some randomness, hands it to the hardware wallet, and the hardware wallet mixes in this randomness into its nonce, okay? Um, this is great. It means that if you are able to produce uniform randomness, or if the hardware token is able to produce uniform randomness, then the result will be uniform. And in particular, if the hardware wallet is trying to like undermine you in some way, uh, then that then you will undermine the undermining, um, which is awesome. Except here we're going to run into like the first of many implementation difficulties with trying to do cool, simple ideas. Um, so if you naively combine RFC six nine seven nine, the hardware wallet's going through this deterministic process and then you give it some randomness to mix in, you can extract secret keys from the hardware wallet, at least if you implement this in a naive way. Um, so in, in signature folklore, we have this uh, meme, like never reuse nonces, but also actually you can't ever reuse related nonces. So if your hardware wallet's producing the same nonce and then um, offsetting it with some host provided randomness, and it offsets that with different host provided randomness at different times, those are called those are related nonces. The difference between those will be the difference of the modification. Um, and it turns out, 
there's a stronger meme that should be out there that never reuse nonces, never, never reuse related nonces. And importantly, you're allowed to reuse your nonces as long as you sign the same message, because you'll produce the same signature over and over. It turns out if you're using related nonces, even if you've got the same message, you're still going to leak your key. And that's what happens here. So what you need to do to implement this in practice is the hardware wallet needs to pre-commit to its, um, oh, how does this even work now? The, so the naive thing to do, or to fix this, would be to have the hardware wallet first tell you, um, would be to have you first provide the randomness that you want to mix in to the hardware wallet's nonce. And the hardware wallet, when doing the RFC 6979 thing, will mix in that along with the secret key and message, and then that way it will always be using a different base nonce for different tweaks. The problem there is that you can actually, the hardware wallet still retains the ability to bias by like grinding through, just trying different possibilities until it gets one that's biased. Um, so what you need to do is send the hardware wallet a pre-commitment to the tweak you want it to add. The hardware wallet will mix in the pre-commitment to the tweak into the nonce that it's going to use. It provides you the nonce it's going to use. Then you provide the actual randomness, and then it mixes the randomness in. If you do it in that order, I think that's three, four steps, then you're great. So the lesson here is don't be naive. And the meta lesson here is like, ugh. Um, and this was, so the way this was discovered, and this is going to be a pattern, was that I wrote an API to do this uh, signed a contract thing. I thought, this is great. I'm eliminating a non bias side channel. This is awesome. Um, my colleague, Jonas Nick, looked at this. He said, I can extract keys with this. And I said, ugh. Every time I write, I write an API and you can extract keys with it. And it's scary because intuitively, I'm taking a public nonce and I'm providing like a public tweak. Everything, all the communication between the hardware wallet and the host here is like completely public. So it was, it kind of caught me off guard and then I, I learned the lessons that I put here in parentheses and everything's good. Okay, um, don't be naive. Um, moving on, let's talk about multi-signatures, okay? And we can sort of think of that nonce thing as like a precursor to multi-signatures. We're going from having a single entity producing a signature to having like a hardware wallet and a host jointly producing a signature, and that's where things start to go a little bit off the rails, okay? So intuitively, uh, the reason we love Schnorr multi-signatures is exactly what I said on the first slide. We have this equation here, which I copied from the first slide, except changed a minus to a plus. Um, everybody chooses a random nonce. Step one, everyone adds their nonces together, hashes up the, the result. Step two, everyone produces a signature, then adds those together. Great, you have a multi-signature. No, no thought required, no crazy new protocols, no extra crypto, no multiple steps, no repeats, like, or no, uh, no um, additional rounds of communication. Great. This, uh, this is a bit more subtle than, it, uh, than I'm making it seem, okay? So intuitively, you could literally just add all the different nonces together and add the signatures together, and you would get a single signature for the sum of everyone's keys. This is dangerous, okay? The reason being, that um, if you just start with a bunch of different signers' public keys and add them together to get a joint public key, which is how the, screen, the scheme I hand waved about uh, actually works, then one person, the last person to contribute their key, could just subtract, think up a key, subtract everyone else's keys from that, and say, oh, this is my key, like, I promise. And then when you add them all together, like, they've canceled out everyone else's key, so now they have a joint key that is entirely controlled by one person. This is called a rogue key attack. So to prevent this, you need to somehow like re-randomize the keys in a certain way, so that if somebody tries to produce their key as a sum of other people's keys, then uh, this re-randomization is going to undermine them. And we had a way to do this. Um, initially, where basically you would take your key, you would hash your key, and mix that into your secret key. It turns out this is broken by something called Wagner's algorithm, which is like, ugh. Um, what Wagner's algorithm lets you do is as an attacker, given like a whole bunch of random numbers, if you're allowed to just keep generating random numbers over and over, you can find a whole bunch of them that add to zero. So you can have a whole bunch of 256-bit hashes and find a large set of them, but, well, not very large, like 500 maybe, um, and with not a lot of work, well, like two to the 60 or so, you can find a bunch that add to zero, or add to one, or add to whatever you might want it to do. And this is, much, this is tractable, right? Two to the 60 is tractable. 2 to the 128 for collisions is not tractable. 2 to the 256 for, for other things is not tractable. But this is tractable. 
And what this means is that if you let an attacker just keep choosing keys and every key gets its own randomness, they can somehow still choose their key so that when you add up all the randomized keys, it still adds up to their original key. Very frustrating. Um, so you have to mix randomness from every key into every other key. Um, in practice, you hash up the whole list of keys, and then for each key, you hash that list along with the individual key, and, and that's how you do your randomness. Um, also, it turns out there's an extra step here. I've been saying add the nonces and add the signatures. It turns out everybody has to pre-commit to their nonce before revealing their nonces before they can add them. And the reason, again, is that you can use Wagner's algorithm on the message hashes, otherwise, for an attacker to like choose their nonces in such a way that they can get a free signature out of this. They can like start a whole bunch of parallel signing sessions with some people they want to attack, like 511 signing sessions, and then they can get a 512th signature by completing the 511, using their carefully chosen nonces and Wagner's algorithm to get all of their existing signatures to add up to another one, okay? So you have to pre-commit. That undermines this. You have to mix randomness from every key into every key. That, also, that undermines the more naive thing. There you go. And the resulting scheme is something called MUSIG, um, which, uh, which had an, an interesting history. We originally published MUSIG with a security proof that got through peer review without this pre-commitment step. Um, and, uh, and this is actually like, quite heavily reviewed, like, not only by the, journal, um, by the journal referees, but also by like, everyone on our team writing the paper and then several other teams doing competing things. And it was only noticed when another team um, managed to find a proof that our proof couldn't be true, like a weird meta proof. And then they were like, hmm, maybe we should look more closely. And then from there, they're able to find an actual mistake in our proof. That, and then still later, they found an actual attack using Wagner's algorithm. So, uh, so the resulting, the final paper that like finally got published, um, and, and fortunately during this whole drama, our paper fortunately was being held up uh, just in the, in the normal publishing like review cycles. So we had time to fix it. So the final published version, like the version that actually got published, did not have this bug. But it was a close call and kind of like kind of a scary thing that something this subtle got through. Um, and the mistake in the proof was really subtle. It was a, it was a long and complicated proof, and, and it was subtle. But there we go. That's music. Um, moving on, let's talk about implementing music now that we have a scheme that's secure. Here's the thing. If you mix RFC 6979 and multi-signatures, again, you can extract keys. And the problem here is that unlike in the host um, hardware wallet scheme, where as long as you do things in the right order to make sure that when the hardware wallet is choosing its randomness, it's ensuring that it will use a different random, um, it, will, it will use a different random nonce no matter what input you give it just by like, having everybody else pre-commit, and then you, you mix the pre-commitments in. You can't do this with multi-signatures. Somebody has to go first when publishing their nonces or when choosing their nonces. And that somebody doesn't know what other people's nonces will be, and that's going to get mixed into the message hash. Okay? Um, it doesn't matter how many pre-commitment rounds you add. It doesn't matter how you reorder things. Basically, like, this is life. If you are deterministically generating your nonces, then it is possible for somebody to play forward the scheme um, or, or do a multi-signature with you, um, choose some nonce, and then do another multi-signature with you on the same message, same key, everything, but they choose a different nonce this time, and the two schemes together, uh, or the, the resulting signatures together, will be sufficient for them to extract your key. So you can't use deterministic nonces. Unless maybe, and I'm not going to go into this, but if everybody uses deterministic nonces, and everybody provides a zero knowledge proof that they did so, then nobody has room to like tweak their own contributions. Like, but this is this is getting very complicated. Okay, um, it would be better to just like not do deterministic nonces. Um, well, is it better? It's not really better because if you need your hardware wallet to be generating random nonces without any sort of deterministic scheme, now you're back to all the old problems of being in principle unverifiable. Like even if you like extract the secret keys and break open the signatures, there's not going to be any anything to look for in what the nonce should be. Um, you have to worry about nonce biasing. You have to worry about like deliberate nonce biasing as well as just like hardware like glitching and like heat, um, like all the the natural ways that bias occurs. Um, you also have to worry about replay attacks. A, na a natural way to do this maybe is your hardware wallet has like a counter and it's just mixing a counter into uh, a hash and doing like the 6979 thing, but like always incrementing a counter. 
You have to worry about somebody somehow reverting the counter or glitching you or replaying or something. Basically, you either need an RNG or you need some state that can't be reversed. And this, these are both difficult with hardware wallets, okay? Um, so, you need fresh randomness. Um, no RFC 6979, that's all I want to say about that. Um, and we also need to, we still need to do the whole music thing. Everybody needs to pre-commit to their nonce. There's three rounds here. Pre-commit to the nonce, reveal the nonce, reveal the signatures. And when we were implementing this, I said, well, this sucks. But, you know, I already have a three-round protocol going on in, in some system that I'm developing. And uh, I don't know the message until, like, the last moment. But can I at least, like, have everybody share the nonces alongside sharing their contribution to the message? And then that way I can kind of do something in parallel. And if anything goes wrong, I can, like, restart and I can do the next attempt in parallel with the old attempt and, and, or something like that. I wanted to choose, I wanted to let my people, um, my, my signers, um, contribute their pre-commitments to their nonces before knowing the message. And this seemed very straightforward. Um, we changed our API a little bit to allow this to happen. Um, and then it turned out two days ago, this is after two years of iteration on this, by the way. Two days ago, Jonas uh, sends me a message. He's like, oh, I found a Wagner's, like, Wagner's algorithm attack on this. You have, to, like, you have to know the message before you use your nonce. Okay, fine. Um, but it's frustrating that this kind of came at me out of nowhere, although there's a lesson here. Um, Aravind was talking about the value of provable security. When I tried to reorder the nonce um, sharing with the message choosing, I was actually violating the protocol as described in the paper. And therefore, the security proof in our paper no longer applied, and it turned out in this case, like, there was actually an attack. So there's a lesson there about not reordering things in papers. If, if you implement a different protocol than is in a paper, then you implemented a different protocol and its security proof does not apply to you. And I was, I guess I got cocky um, about this and I got burned. So that sucks. Let's move on to threshold signatures. Um, and I'm gonna kind of rush through this. Um, there's actually not a whole lot to say. The first thing I wanna say is everything I just said for multi-signatures. As you first let me define a threshold signature versus multi-signature, because we tend to be a bit sloppy in this space about this distinction. Multi-signature is you have a whole bunch of people contributing to a signature, they produce a single signature, okay? And in the academic space, actually, like, your verifiers know, like, the whole list of keys, and they know the original participants, and they just have a single signature to verify, whatever. Um, a threshold signature, maybe you need fewer than everybody. Maybe you have 10 participants, and you want any eight of them to be able to produce a signature. This is called a threshold signature. Um, Schnorr threshold signatures are super easy because we have this nice linear structure to our equations. Um, everybody, there's a key setup round where everybody secret shares their keys, everybody shares their shares, and like they need like private communication channels for this. It's actually a little bit involved. Then everybody replaces their individual keys with like sums of their share and everybody else's shares. And then at signing time, you have your eight people together who have whatever eight they happen to be, and they're able to just do the multi-signature algorithm. They all choose nonces, you add these up, they take their keys and they kind of weight them by these things called the Grange multipliers that change depending on which set of eight participants you have. Um, they produce signatures, you add the signatures together, everything's great, right? Super simple. Um, well, all right, there's more nonce uh, debiasing issues here. Um, one is that you really have to choose a new nonce for every signature attempt here. Um, the trick is that even if you're signing with the same key, the same set of signers, and the same message, and like the same everything, and you've got zero knowledge proofs and like all that good stuff, um, if you sign with a different set of participants, the resulting combined nonce might be different, in which case you could have key extraction as well. So again, choose your nonces very carefully, which means unverifiably and with great difficulty. And then another issue with threshold signatures um, is that in principle, the point of threshold signatures is that you have resilience against some parties not being available at signing time. But like in practice, probably you do have all of your parties available. And ideally, you could say, well, if I, if I only need eight participants to produce the signer with 10 people contributing to the key, um, ideally like all 10 could contribute and if two of them are, are screwing around somehow, we can just boot them out and then, um, and then that's great. The reason we have a threshold signature is to protect against not only people being out, but also adversarial behavior. Um, it turns out it's pretty involved to do that. So first off, it's difficult to recover gracefully. Basically, you need to figure out who was screwing around, kick them out, and then restart the protocol. 
Determining who is dishonest is hard. You need to use this thing called publicly verifiable secret sharing. Um, I thought I had some like clever scheme to make that simpler using signatures and stuff. It turned out it didn't work in the case that your adversarial behavior is somebody just like contributing to the first half of the signature and then disappearing. Um, the reason being that if you add requirements for everybody to do things in a valid way and they just don't do it, that's difficult to detect and, and difficult to provide evidence of. Um, so there, there's a whole bunch of technical difficulties there that I'm not going to go into. Um, and then one final like minor note. Um, I've been talking about how important provable security is and how I've gotten burned every time I try to escape from it. So the thing is with threshold signatures, there's this paper saying you can't use, like you don't get provable security without this whole extra um, machinery. Um, and the reason you don't get provable security is because your keys aren't random. And I was like, well, does it matter if your secret keys aren't random? I mean, it matters if the nonces aren't random, but the secret keys stay fixed, so maybe it's okay if they're biased. And then I looked at the paper, and it's not even about the secret keys. It's about the public keys. And like, obviously, that doesn't matter. But I've been burned a lot saying, obviously, things don't matter. So maybe I actually have to deal with this. Um, it's just fine. I mean, there are papers telling you what to do, but the, the point is this stuff is difficult, and there's just like lots of little things to think about, and that's, that's uh, all that I wanted to say. But thank you. Are there any questions? I can't see, although there are lights in my eyes. Thank you so much. I apologize. <laughs> um, uh, does anybody have any quick questions for Andrew? Because I have questions. <laughs> okay. So uh, one of my questions is you said that there was an attack described on MUSIG. And the last time I read the paper, no attack had yet been described or at least published. Can you give us a quick rundown on how that attack worked? Or Okay. Sure. Um, yeah. So the, the attack on the original paper, and this was like almost two years ago. So probably the last time you read it, it has since been fixed. But the original paper did not have this nonce pre-commit round, um, which means that the last person to contribute their nonce to the signature has the ability to kind of grind through their nonce and grind through a lot of different message hashes. So the, uh, in the first slide, I said like E is a hash of, of all this junk. All that junk includes contributions from everybody's nonces. So one signer can grind through a lot of possible message hashes, and then if they do so in parallel, they start like a whole bunch of parallel signing sessions. They can use Wagner's algorithm to make like 512 uh, different message hashes, or actually complete signatures, add up to a 513th signature. And these numbers, by the way, like their order of magnitude is important for how much work you're doing, but like it really doesn't matter like exactly what you're doing. Wagner's attack is pretty general. Basically, the more things you do in parallel, the less work you have to do is how it works. So that's what the attack was. Adding a pre-commitment round means there's no longer any last person to choose their nonce. Everybody is, is stuck with the nonce that they chose before anybody reveals what the real nonces are and therefore what the message hash is. So that, that was a fix. Okay. Thank you. <laughs>